You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Hi, I'm Chuck Allen. I make leather goods and pottery for a living. Chuck Allen is a former U.S. Marine and video producer who left the sleepy town of Washington, D.C. for the bustling metropolis of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Now he's the owner of Earth and Hide, where he makes leather goods and pottery. Normally, these are two very different disciplines, but Chuck combines them to create his uniquely useful pieces. Here's my chat with Chuck Allen. Who are you and what do you make for a living? I'm Chuck Allen. I started Earth and Hide. I do uh, high quality leather goods and other craft work with a timeless rugged simplicity. All right. So how'd you get started doing this? So I've always been a bit of an artsy type. Um, All through high school, I took art classes and that kind of thing. And my first uh, degree was in graphic design and, uh, you know, just kind of taking that artsy thing and trying to make it practical. I ended up uh, joining the U.S. Marines after uh, after college as, uh, as a combat cameraman and uh, served in Iraq after uh, September 11th. And, uh, uh, yeah, I did uh, four years as a combat cameraman and got out, did uh, video work for the federal government until I moved to Canada. I uh, just up and moved my my whole life and figured I would uh, go into the production industry here. But, you know, that's the kind of business. Um, it's, it's such a cool job that I think a lot of people would do it for next to nothing. So it's very competitive and, and it's hard to break in unless you have the established contacts. So coming in, you know, from the, from near Washington, DC to Winnipeg, Manitoba, it was hard for, to just break into the industry. So uh, I ended up taking a job in the construction business, which I had never done any construction work in my entire life. So I'm like 36 years old at the time, starting a brand new industry, the bottom of the barrel. I went from making uh, like $84,000 US a year, you know, as a video producer to uh, $12 Canadian an hour (laughs) with a family of five, because I just, I needed to make the move. Why did you make the move? What was going on there and, and, and what brought you up to, to, to Winnipeg? Uh, long story short, family. Um, my oldest son has lived here with his mother his whole life. And the original plan was to move here after I left the Marines. But uh, life got in the way, whatever. It didn't end up happening. But I told my wife I'd like to be here before he starts high school. So he was still in middle school. We were able to, to make that happen. And uh, yeah, it's just an important time in a boy's life. So I, I, I wanted to, to do that. And uh, we were able to make it happen. And, and it was like, I mean, even without that, like just for my mental health and uh, I, I just like it here, but Washington DC is um, <laughs> it's a very hard region to live. Uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. I read a statistic that uh, you're four times more likely to be run into in traffic on purpose in Washington DC than anywhere else in North America. I don't know like if that's legit, but it sounds legit because there's this really inflated sense of self-importance there. Uh, there's a lot of legit high profile people there with all the politicians and uh, military generals and, and heads of whatever agencies and stuff. And, and you'll see it like there'll be motorcades, not pre- not necessarily presidential motorcades, but generals have their drivers with the lights and the blow through traffic. And like, so, so there's high profile people. There's people who work for high profile people, right? Like, do you know who, who I work for kind of thing. Right. And then there's people who think they should be important. Right. <laughs> so everybody like there's this inflated sense of importance. it's just, and it, it does, it manifests in traffic and in the, and in, in line at the store, like just a negative kind of vibe going on there. And so I was really happy to leave and uh, yeah, even giving up so much uh, I was happy to be here. And, you know, I made a lot of realizations about myself. Like I said, I, I started in graphic design because that was a very practical way to use my artsy nature, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been told my whole life, my dad was one of the first ones to tell me, you know, you need to do something practical with that, right? Like, he's always <laughs> wanted me to be a police sketch artist. Like, what? do we even have those stuff? <laughs> like, it's all AI but, now. Uh, yeah. So I've always, you know, had that pursuit of like having a real job, doing something practical with, you know, my talents. And, 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 and I did that and, uh, and I was able to, you know, achieve a level of success with that, but it wasn't as fulfilling as, as I thought it could or should be. So you were, you came up here and you were, you, you got into construction. Yeah. How did things go from there? Well, so yeah, so I, uh, I ended up, so 
I was using the military gives you benefits for college uh, or university, right? So I ended up getting a bachelor's degree in business. And so I'm, I'm working for this construction company. I'm, I'm loving it, by the way. Like I had one of the best crews. It was just a fantastic, uh, you know, you're working outside. You could, I could, I, I could put in my mind that I was helping a buddy on his cottage or something every day. Like I was just around my friends, telling jokes, smoking cigarettes, hanging out. Like it was, it was hard work. Don't get me wrong, but you look, you, you stop at the end of the day. You're like, man, you know, I did something. I feel good because yeah, you can look at what you've accomplished. I look, yeah. Like that is something, you know, worth something, you know? And, and it was just, it was really fulfilling. And like, I would work 10 hour days, no problem. And it was, it was very fulfilling. It was fulfilling in a way that uh, the video and graphics work never was for me. Right. And I was really surprised at that. And, um, but I still had this kind of this something inside of me that needed an outlet. And so I took a pottery class through, uh, through the city. And so uh, I, I took the first one because when I, you know, in those high school classes, I, I always took the pottery. Like it was my favorite unit in, in art class. And so I told myself, self, I'm going to revisit this and as an adult. And so at 36, whatever years old, I'm like, okay, I'm an adult. I should probably do this. So I'm going to do this. Right. <laughs> So, so yeah, I started with pottery class, took one and I took to it instantly, took the next one. And just because like, I didn't need the, the teacher at that point, I just wanted access to the, to the wheel and the kiln and, and, and stuff like that. And so finally, after the second one, a buddy of mine uh, was like, Hey, I've always you know, wanted to get some pottery equipment too. I, I've dabbled in enjoy it. So, so we split the cost of a wheel and a kiln and uh, we keep it at his place and, and so that was what four years ago by now, something like that. And and we're still sharing it, and uh, uh, it's actually firing tonight, actually. Um, but uh, so that's actually the earth component of earth and hide. Um, and and it, with everything I've done, I've always tried to um, to not really zig when others zag, but find a way to fit in yet stand out, right? So like with pottery, there's a lot of like very modern and clean style. There's a lot of like very traditional style too. And like like um, a lot of these craft fairs, you see yarn bowls. I don't know how many people need a <laughs> yarn bowl, but you see dozens of them in every craft fair. I mean, not to knock that traditional style, but like I didn't know there was that many knitters that could use a yarn bowl. But I, I like, and I can appreciate both those styles. And, um but I wanted to do something that was that combined some traditional with some some contemporary, and um, so so I kind of started. You know, everybody ends up with their own style to an extent. But um, I started putting graphics. You can there. I uh, I found a way that you can silk screen on uh, on pottery using an underglaze, and um, it's really cool. So so I have a, a line of uh, graphic mugs, and then. Uh, I, you know, I realized I don't see a lot of mixed media in uh, in pottery. So I, I I thought if I could fire on these tabs, I could put a wooden handle and dowel through the tab, and like I could have a wooden handled mug. I've never seen that before. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. So I did it, and uh, it turned out just amazing. I had this two tone uh, uh, maple with the walnut uh, overlay handle, um, just looks fantastic. And then. Uh, well, I'm going to do another piece. Uh, oh, my kids came home with a paracord bracelet, you know, those braided uh, cord bracelets. And I felt like that's firm enough. I bet it could be a handle, right? So I I, taught, I looked up and researched how to do the braiding and, and then figured out how to wrap the mug with the braided handle. And I had this really cool uh, wrapped mug with a braided handle. And uh, somebody saw that and they said, you should do that with leather. I'm like, yes, brilliant. <laughs> so I think he thought you know, leather cord wrap, but, uh, immediately in my mind's eye, I had this nice wide leather kind of wrap and then, a uh, a strap that was folded in half and stitched together. Like it was like, as soon as he said that, no kidding. It was almost a, a fully formed idea in my head without having ever done leather work in my life. So I go down to the leather store and I'm like, okay, I have this vision. I have this thing I want to do. And I, I started talking to them and they're like, okay, I don't really get it, but it sounds like you need to stitch some stuff in this. This is this is what you need to get started, right? So, long story short, it's already long, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we got time. It's yeah, all digital <laughs> to keep. Uh, so yeah, so they they got me started with what I needed to do what I wanted to accomplish with with the leather, you know. So I uh, I started down the leather path, and and once I I learned enough to uh, 
to do a couple of things. I'm like, well, oh, you know, I want a slim front pocket wallet, right? I'll, I'll just make one, right? And I wanted one of these like fancy leather laptop bags. I can't afford that. I'll just make one. Uh, so each thing I, I, I made for myself initially and, and how am I going to use this? What features do I want in it? Um, and, and that's the good thing about being a maker, right? You can make it how you want. And you can make it with the best quality materials you can find, right? And that's the way I've, I've almost always approached everything that I make. Who taught you the leather stuff? I mean, you can't just fall ass backwards into <laughs> making laptop bags. Uh, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I know I can. So, Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, the the um, the people at the leather store, um, just fantastic group. Uh, they uh, they they pointed me in the right direction with the tools that I needed and and the basic concepts. And then, I mean, I, I was a degree in YouTube University. Like, <laughs> I just looked up, you know, online. Like, what do I like? How does it? And reverse engineering kind of patterns and designs. And well, and there's the practical side of your design background, and then right. your, your your construction side. Exactly. Yeah, and and even the pottery side. Yeah, so much of that is intertwined. Every step of my life, no kidding, has kind of been a stepping stone, and like, and I'm still using almost everything I've learned in, in different capacities, you know, with my business. So, so where do you look for inspiration then? I mean, you were saying that you know it, it's something you wanted and then you figured out how to make it. Yeah. Is, is is that basically what it is? If there's a practical need and you go out and find a solution? Yeah. It's um, anytime I make a product, I have to be able to put myself in the, in the position of the user, right? Even if it's a feminine type bag, right? Like the tote bag, you don't see a lot of men carrying these bucket totes around, but I can envision myself actually carrying that. Right. So my keys, my wallet, my phone, pens and pencils, it would all, like go right to the bottom, right? So that thing needs pockets, right? So I figured out a way to to rivet pockets to or use the rivets for the handles to attach a pocket inside, so you don't see it from the outside. It's just it's kind of a hidden hidden feature. And then behind the the exterior pocket is it's an eight by eight square on the front of my bag. It's as much a design pe- uh, feature as it is a, a functional pocket, right? But behind that, there's a five by seven pocket that's stitched on the inside, right? So, and that has your cell phone and, and pens and pencil slot, right? So how do I build those functions in while retaining the simplicity uh, that I want for the exterior, right? And yeah, so th- that's the thing. It's, it's got to like, my wallet has to be accessible, cell phone, pens and pencils, keys, whatever. And it's all right there in the pockets. I, I've been joking lately. I, uh, <laughs> at the markets, I'll, I'll, I'll be showing off these bags or whatever. And I'll say, you know, I found the way to a woman's heart is through pockets, right? <laughs> and they're like, yes, you know, <laughs> they realize it has pockets and they're all in. <laughs> I just love it. But, but that just came from me being able to like put myself in the shoes of the user right you ever run out of ideas like you ever hit hit a block and you just go down i don't even know what i'm gonna make i mean because you've got a functional product and because you're looking you're, you're, you're looking at, at pottery you're looking at bags there's a certain functional nature to it but there's art behind what you're making and i'm just kind of curious do you ever run into that that empty canvas that empty page kind of issue well no um there's oh, that's always good. We covered that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's it. No, there's I have I have more ideas than I have time for, you know, or resources for. So really what it comes down to, like I have my production pieces, I have my uh, exclusive pieces, right? I have those things that I want to keep in stock. And that be like having made the design, right? And then just the challenge of the production pieces becoming more efficient, like that kind of feeds the creativity of like that challenge solving a problem right and um like when i lay out a hide right i have to look at that hide like i'm looking at a canvas and like there's a blemish here or or i know this is the strongest area of the hide or there's kind of some something uh here or i want to incorporate specific like there's a cattle brand here that i want to like specifically incorporate right um i i look at the the hide as as the canvas or like when i'm at the potter's wheel you know every piece it used to be how like I would say, oh yeah, the clay speaks to me, right? And and it was just because I wasn't a good enough potter to control the clay, right? It was like, okay, well this time it's doing this, so I'm just gonna make it that, right? But you'll find that the best, and I actually call myself a craftsman rather than an artist. So the best craftsmen are able to control their medium 
to be consistent, right? And that's that's part of being a professional. But then retaining the art of it is is still important to me. There's about, and I don't know if you've uh, seen my uh, my side project, so to speak, the Chuck Wagon. Uh, oh, I haven't. I have, <laughs> what is that? Um, it's a uh, it's a trailer that I'm converting into a uh, a mini. Uh, you've, you've heard of a tiny home. Well, this is going to be a tiny store. This past Christmas, I did uh, what I call my world tour. Uh, it was my first time selling out of province, and I went. I jumped off the deep end and did markets in Vancouver and uh, Calgary, uh, Saskatoon, back here in Winnipeg for uh, uh, a week, and then in, in Toronto for one of a kind. And I, I drove the whole way. I rented a, a cargo van and had a buddy uh, with me the whole time. And uh, that's a great road trip. Yeah. Oh man, it was it was incredible. <laughs> um, we. we found friends and family to stay with at every stop. It was amazing. And at one stop uh, in Calgary, um, we stayed with a friend's grandparents, which was, fr- it was so weird, but absolutely amazing. These people were the most grandparent, like, I mean, they are obviously grandparents, right? But we, so we roll in at nine o'clock at night. I figured they might be ready to go to bed, but they're playing cards with their friends. Like, so have you eaten anything? And I said, no, but and as soon as no came out of my mouth, I wasn't like, she was in that refrigerator. Like, had, and then I like, I have celiac disease. So I have to be gluten-free, but I don't want to impose that on people. I say, but I'm gluten-free. Oh no, no problem. My grandson's gluten-free. Blah, blah. So the next morning we get up and I'm like, is that bacon cooking? Like she, they had, <laughs> they fed us breakfast every morning. And I'm like, we should be paying you hundreds of dollars a night here because this is like the level of service. Like I, I just couldn't imagine, but <laughs> it was, it was a phenomenal trip uh, and a rent event. So, so that was kind of proof of concept. Like I've got this, this tour that I can do. I, I will likely do every Christmas. Right. And instead of having to rent a van for however much I, this vehicle will pay for itself in, you know, a matter of years. Right. And then with the conversion on top of it, uh, I'm planning on putting a futon and a bunk in there. Uh, I have a little kitchenette that's uh, going in there and then a work table with little hold inventory and a sewing machine. I have uh, solar panels uh, for the roof as well as a rooftop patio just for the fun of it. Um, Hashtag I mean, van life. There you go. That's right. It's got <laughs> a, it's got hardwood floor, shiplap walls, a pressed tin ceiling. Like You did all this work? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, me and friends. Again, I have a plethora of just amazingly talented friends who are kind enough to help me out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's all, uh, all coming together as we speak. Coming together to achieve what, what's the the goal here? Well, I mean, I have this grand vision for this thing, right. Just to travel across country, uh, you know, have it as a showpiece, right. I can invite people in. Uh, oh, uh, wood burning fireplace. Like I have this little <laughs> mini wood stove. That's going. It's going to be a showpiece. It's going to be like you're, walking into a, a log cabin right uh, but it's going to be a tiny uh a workshop right so I, i'll have my anvil i'll have my uh, my workbench and, and cutting table and and a sewing machine in there right so instead of having any downtime in between the shows i can literally make my way across canada right <laughs> <laughs> imagine that as a reality show <laughs> okay right and it's just like it'll be a showpiece like it, it ha, it'll have my big logo on the side it'll be uh, like i'll be able to sleep in there instead of having to pay for a hotel room in every city instead of having to rent a van you know I, i've got this i own this vehicle right so uh you know it solves all kinds of problems also being concerned about transporting your stuff i hear this time and time again that getting your wares to the different uh markets is pretty nerve-wracking yeah. can be very costly uh yeah. you know you really got to trust yeah. who's moving yourself especially if you're not traveling with it and even if you're right. i guess yeah yeah if you're trying i mean i mean there is a, a risk too like if you're if you've got to get there in three days and you have a flat tire or something goes wrong or whatever like that you can't fix in a matter of hours like then you're you're hooped so you still have to give yourself plenty of time and uh, just get caa <laughs> yeah yeah exactly there's all kinds of things that can go wrong but there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in any situation but but yeah i mean this thing it's it's uh 
it solves a number of different problems and uh, you know on a number of different not just traveling to shows but i can use this in lieu of uh paying for a storefront for like right now i'm just working out of my home and, and i have to invite people to my house for pickups or whatever or if you know they want to look at inventory right it's either meeting in a sketchy coffee shop or uh inviting sketchy people to my house right either way it's not <laughs> not super professional so so here <laughs> not not to drag in a trailer to a parking lot to meet somebody's like <laughs> high class or anything, but you know, the way it's outfitted with a pressed tin ceiling. I mean, come on. It's- that Then you just call it branding. Right. Exactly. You're creating an atmosphere. You see. That's right. Well, so that, that is my next question for you, which is how are you running this business? I mean, this is all you all on your own. You're making it, you're coming up with it, you're selling it. You're obviously driving the stuff there. This is all you. I mean, yeah, 90, 90% of it is. I mean, my wife uh, is a massive family support. She incidentally works full time. So while I'm reinvesting almost every dollar back into the business, she's essentially got the household uh, budget, you know, mostly balanced. I, I do draw from some income uh, from the business, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, so, so that's a massive help on that. end. but she also takes the time, like, especially around Christmas, uh, I'll identify some tasks uh, they're not mindless tasks. They're not things that, like she, uh, like stamping the logo on the bag. Like I've got a finished, you know, three or $400 bag and babe, you've got to put this logo there. And if you punch through the leather, $400 bag is, is ruined, right? <laughs> so, but she's got like, she's, she will uh, punch the logos on the bag or she'll, uh, there's tasks in putting together belts or, you know, different things that I can bring her into. Uh, Do you find having that support is, is helpful and meaningful? Yeah, I mean, she, to, in our relationship, to be able to work together, you know, and like she comes to the business with a heart of service, right? And then my service to her is trying to run a successful business, right? So there's this real give and take with that. And, you know, just, you know, I, I try to bring my kids into it whenever I can. You know, my kids actually, they're super proud. Like, hey, my dad's got, you know, thousands of Instagram followers and whatever, like they, they think that's pretty cool or whatever. And, <laughs> and you know, they, they can see what I've done and they can appreciate it on a certain level. But do you think any of your kids are going to get involved in the business down the road? Um, so my oldest two have very little interest in anything artsy or like uh, making like I do. Um, my youngest son uh, likes it quite a bit. He likes being involved, but my daughter, she is my little artist. she, she loves making, she loves doing, she loves, uh, you know, the creativity and, and she's always right there if, uh, if she can do anything. So what's sort of the biggest challenge you run into and what's difficult about this? So, so, um, yeah, my wife, not only does she help like, uh, with some of the production, she also, for the most part, she runs the website. She works for a tech company and she has some resources through work that if she runs into a problem, she can ask questions. Uh, and we also do some trade for some, uh, some backend like programming stuff, um, with some of her coworkers, we'll trade some leather goods or whatever. And, and, um, so, so yeah, she does the website and I have hired a bookkeeper finally to, to get me on track. So, so I do have help with a certain amount of it, but, um, as far as, yeah, being obviously the face of the company doing, uh, 99% of the actual production work, uh, you know, hundred percent of the designs, like that's, that's all me. And then, yeah, all, all day, every day at almost all at, at all the markets, uh, it's me. She actually has done some markets on her own, but. And she'll usually help me with the ones that she can attend. But uh, I do some classes too, like some workshops, some paid workshops. So the tote bag, the backpack, and the clutch bag, I, I do uh, workshops for. So um, where are those online or are those uh, are those at like local? They're local, yeah. They're in person. So uh, the tote bag, for example, uh, that's my that's probably the most popular product of mine. It's the most popular class, and so it's a two evening class. Say it's on a Tuesday, it'll be on consecutive Tuesdays, um, three hours per Tuesday, and then they go home in between with some stitching homework, hand stitching homework. So, so uh, people love the class, and like I love, like I love what I do, and I want to bring that to other people, right? Um, so this past Christmas, I was just like, we kind of ran through the numbers and like, okay, well, pretty much half my sales come from belts. So I needed to make something like 400 belts. 
right? Like that's a lot of freaking belts. And, and it's one of the easier things like to get people involved with. So we actually on two different evenings, we're like, Hey, we're going to have a belt making party. You know, you know how your friends ask you to move. This is way more fun than that. Like <laughs> we're going to have some uh, margaritas and some, some chips and dip. And like, we're, we're going to put some music on, we're going to hang out and we'll have different stations. Uh, we're all just going to hang out and make belts, you know? And, uh, and so, so yeah, we had about five people over each night and, uh, I just hung out around ball. the table. Yeah, it was, it, I love it. And, and I have kind of a, an open invitation, uh, to, to any of my acquaintances. Like if you want to come just hang out and do some leather work, like I'm not going to charge you for a class, but I'm also not going to let you keep what we make. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> so part uh, of the process. Now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and, I've, I've had people call, you know, take me up on that. And we talk about life, you know, we talk about everything and, and going back even further, like to, to why I got into this, um, you know, I have, I have a bit of a history with some depression. Right. And so when I really got started with the leather stuff, uh, I was in a pretty, pretty dark spot emotionally. Right. So um, with the pottery, like, like you see on the cartoon, the spinning, right? It is, it's very hypnotized. So if a cartoon character is hypnotized, their, their eyes are spinning, right? Well, the, the potter's wheel, right? Is, is, is kind of hypnotizing in that way, you know, and it can really draw you in. Um, and then the uh, hand stitching with the leather, you know, it's, it's needles back and forth and uh, it's, it's very rhythmic and, and hypnotizing in its own way. And, and when things like that can draw you in, uh, you know, that's positive and productive, right? Um, and it can draw you away from things, you know, the negativity that can be chasing, right? So that's ultimately why I do this or started doing this and why I pretty much have to continue doing this, right? And then really why I started selling it. If I continue to do it and didn't sell it, I'd just be covered in leather goods, right? <laughs> And I wouldn't have the money to like, I'd go broke, you know, try to pay for all the, yeah, the 400 supplies, belts right? on and no money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I have to keep you. And, but at the same time, I, I want to bring that, that kind of therapeutic benefit to other people. And so, so one of the things that I always want to be about is, uh, is hope and positive mental health. You know, the hope that it brought me in a dark time. I want to bring that hope to other people and just be, you know, that, that light of positivity for, for other people. And if I can, so it sounds like you've got some pretty full days. I mean, it sounds like ducks till dawn, you are yeah. making leather. How does a day look for you? I mean, how do you find time for it all? Well, uh, in no way am I in danger of being overworked. Okay. <laughs> like I, I do like, there's no way I have time for all my ideas, but I don't pursue all my ideas. Right. I, I definitely kind of compartmentalize it. Um, you know, my wife, when, when we, you know, on a normal day, she'll go to work before, um, before the kids have to go to school. Right. And so the youngest, uh, like I have to stay home or be available to get the kids off to school. Right. And then um, typically, you know, be home for the kids to, to be home. But yeah, I mean, otherwise I can kind of just hide downstairs and, uh, you know, I have a running list of like, projects that are on my table that are in various stages of completion or whatever and that okay well these are wood sided tool boxes that i have they've been over here for a while i need to get to them or or i haven't you know these are in my queue of orders that i need to you know get out by the end of the week right and so that i can just diligently kind of sit and do what i need to do to to kind of work through the the task list i mean and i'm usually done around dinner time and I can come upstairs if, um, if I want to be, you know, continue to be productive, I can, uh, I can have something, uh, to hand stitch while I'm upstairs with the family. But, you know, it's really important to me that I, I maintain a balance, right? Like there will be seasons around the Christmas season from, it was this past year from, um, from Halloween to like December, like, uh, eighth or ninth or something like that. I was on the road. Like I was gone. I was, Every day I was pushing and uh, I mean, it, it was a grind, right? I didn't have that day of rest that I try to maintain every week. Right. Uh, but when I'm home, I take, if it, if I have a market through the weekend and I can't take Sunday, like totally off, I will pick another day and I'll just 
lay on the couch or I'll, I'll, I'll pick that as my day of rest. And I'm, I'm pretty firm about maintaining that. Otherwise, yeah, like if I'm not like hustling super hard for market inventory or, or uh, you know, a flood of orders, then yeah, it's from you know nine to five. I keep a pretty, um, pretty balanced schedule that way. Let me ask you at the end of a day, the kids come home and you're finished off and you come upstairs do you look back and do you feel the same sense of accomplishment as you felt on the construction site? Does it fill you with that same type of pride? Yeah, it does. It does because, um, you know, I can, I can physically look at the bags or whatever pieces that I've created and I, I can like stack them up or here's, you know, this goes into the inventory box or whatever, but I can also like just add to my uh, inventory spreadsheet. Right. And then see the dollar value there, like <laughs> the increase. So, um, I think more satisfaction honestly comes from, you know, the stack of goods and like, Hey, I made this right. Then, then the dollar sign, but uh, you know, the dollar sign definitely is, has a level of gratification too. What advice would you give to somebody who was going to get into the the leather game, the ceramics game? Uh, you know, I've been asked that a lot recently and, and um, two, uh, two things is to, you know, find the meaning in your work. Uh, the meaning in my work is that positive mental health and the hope. Uh, that that I got from it, you know, and and for me that translates into uh, serving the customer and producing a quality piece. The second piece is to tell the story, right? So you have a meaning and you tell the story. Every piece that I have, I I give it a name of somebody important in my life, uh, like the Luella tote. Okay, Luella is my mother. You know, she raised me as a single mother, and. She's much tougher, as single mothers will, will be. She's much tougher than she has to be. But uh, you know, she retains this uh, understated uh, class and elegance about her. If you saw her, you would know, right? Like, she's got this understated class and elegance. But, yeah, surprisingly strong. So this tote bag has those as its main characteristics, right? The The construction is one single piece of leather around the bottom, right? So there's no seam to fail. You could carry bricks in that thing and it wouldn't fail. The handles are held together by rivets, hand bashed copper rivets. So after setting those rivets, it's almost as good as if those handles were welded on, like no kidding. It's a mechanical fit that you can't pull apart. So, so it's way stronger than it would ever have to be, right? But it also has this understated elegance to it. Um, you know, it's, you're not going to carry it to a black tie affair or anything, but, uh, you know, it's got that just simple, just elegance, you know, you can carry it almost anywhere else. Right. So, you know, being able to tell that story, I mean, that maybe that's a romanticized view of, you know, a simple tote bag, but to me, it has meaning, right? Because the people in my life, it give me meaning and I want to, you know, convey that meaning to others. And, and, uh, the story you know, conveys the meaning, right? So the meaning in the story, especially, yeah, for artisans, craftspeople, people in the handmade game, like, like that's a big part of it. So where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so uh, you can obviously go to my website, uh, earthandhide.com. Uh, Instagram and Facebook is at earthandhide. Uh, yeah, pretty much everything uh, Earth and Hide. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, thanks so much for being on the show and sharing how you make a living. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Subscribe to Making a Living Show at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. Follow along at Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you like what you hear, please share the show with someone you know. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.